paradigm shift. An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. A genuine expression. A certain Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, two egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect, your common Gilbert style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be, be to the fullest. Uh, help me finish the following sentence, if you would. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? I'm not sure if it's good or bad that you were so ready and able to do that. But now it could be argued that this particular phrase, it's so popular to us, uh, so well known because of Disney, right? And the famous movie that it was a part of. But I would argue this phrase is, is so familiar to us, so popular, so well known, because it actually speaks to a desire that burns deep in the human heart. Let me share a couple of statistics with you that I think might prove my point. In 2007, the US spent $40 billion, that's a B, billion, on cosmetic products. And another $12 billion on cosmetic surgeries. Let me break this down for you just a little bit. Here's another slide that kind of shows. It's a little small, I apologize. But this is, this is what we spend our money on. We spend about $5 billion a year on fragrances. Some of you need to spend a little bit more, probably, on those. Uh, Seven billion on makeup. Nothing to say there. Eight billion dollars on skin care. Nine billion dollars on hair care. And 11 billion dollars on toiletries. Now, as a bald guy, the hair one really cracks me up. I mean, some people pay to make the hair blonde, while others pay to cover up the blonde. Uh, some people pay to style their hair, while others pay to make it look like they don't have a style in their hair. Some pay to cut their hair or remove their hair, while others pay to extend the hair or grow the hair. It's a lot of money being spent on hair, but not mine, but not mine. Let me show you another stat. Americans come in ninth in terms of annual per capita cosmetic spending. It's nice to know that those in the Netherlands and France and Sweden are a little bit more vain than we are, but we're still up there. Now, I show you this slide because I want you to see the very bottom. Number 10 is China. Now, the U.S. spends on average about $202 a year on cosmetic products, but number 10, China, only spends $9 a year. So those top nine countries are blowing a lot of cash to look a certain way. And whether you're in China or the Netherlands, it doesn't matter where you are, people around the world every single day are spending millions of dollars on everything from tangle teaser to tanning beds, tummy tucks, Tory Burch, treatments or tweezers. Those are just the T words I could think of when it came to cosmetics. Every single day and sometimes multiple times a day, people stare into one of these and they truly ask themselves, am I fair? Am I the fairest? Am I fair at all? Does anybody even see me? Does anybody even notice me? Think about this. Now, why is there this obsession, this fixation on all of these things? Why are we so uh, overwhelmed and inundated with anything that can be slapped on, smeared in, injected, digested, enlarged, or enhanced? Why do we gravitate towards all that stuff? It's a desire. It's a desire that's in your heart, a core desire that you have actually been created with. It's your desire for beauty. The human heart, we've been talking about all summer long, is a ceaseless factory of desires. You have been made to hunger and crave for certain things, and you'd be a fool to try to suppress those things or turn away from those things. It's, it's in your DNA. It's how you've been made. And in addition to our desire for power or love or intimacy, we are all driven at one level or another by a desire for beauty, for our desire to be called the fairest of them all. 
Now this desire has two sides to it. The first is, it's the desire to be beautiful. We wanna be considered handsome, cool, attractive, sexy, stunning, put whatever other word you want in there, but we want to be that. But more than just that, we wanna be connected to those things. We want to be with and associated with things that are beautiful. We wanna touch and taste and be a part of true beauty. So every dollar spent, every magazine read, every gym membership signed up for and then forgotten about, every diet started, all of those things, they attest to the reality and the enormity of this one desire. $40 billion a year, $202 for every person. We all wanna be beautiful and we all despise the thought of being considered or called ugly, don't we? Reminds me of the story of a ad that appeared in a country newspaper one day and the ad read like this. Farmer wants to marry woman, 35 years or older, with tractor. Please send picture of tractor. <laughs> See, we're all drawn to beautiful things. It's just a matter of what those things are for you. Uh, maybe it's the beauty of the moon over the water at Pepperdine, the beauty of a woman's body, the beauty of the dimples of my daughter's cheeks, the beauty of a perfectly struck golf ball that goes exactly where I intended for it to go. Maybe it's the beauty of a new tractor. But it's the beauty of something. It's this breathtaking beauty that we all want to behold. And maybe, just maybe, that someone will actually see and behold in us. Do you know this desire? Have you felt the pull, the tug? of this desire to want to be the fairest of them all. Now, some of those statistics I share with you, they seem kind of outrageous, but our obsession makes perfect sense if you think about it. And when biblical authors, when they got a glimpse of the heavenly realm, when they got to see just a part of God, they, they struggled to describe the beauty that they were witnessing. Maybe something similar has happened to you. Maybe you saw something that was so incredible, so unique, so beautiful, you struggled to find white words to describe it. Maybe it was the Swiss Alps. Maybe it was the, the green fields in Scotland. Maybe a, the brand new baby girl. Maybe even just the joy of an orphan in a third world country. But something was so beautiful, so breathtaking, you, you didn't know how to say it. It was like, well, it was kind of like this, but it was also a lot like this. And then you throw in a little bit of this, and that still doesn't describe it. That's how Isaiah, Ezekiel, and John, that's how they all felt when they saw the beauty of God. It was kind of like this, but oh, it was so much like this, and it was even more than that, and you throw in a little bit of this, and I'm still not even getting close. You're not shallow, you're not vain if you want to be beautiful, you're human. You're of God if you want to be beautiful. And I actually think that maybe more than all the other desires, our desire for beauty and our fear of feeling ugly, I think it proves God's very existence. It's almost an apologetic in a way. I mean, think about this, the concept of beauty, it breaks down if there's no standard, no source, no starting point. If everything in the galaxy is just an accident, if we're all part of this evolutionary process that just does what it does, if there's no rhyme, no reason to anything in the world, then you really can't use the term beauty. You couldn't call anything beautiful or anything ugly. I mean, what makes one thing more than the other? And if there's no determining factor, if there's nothing that dictates what beautiful is, then I can call something beautiful that, that you call ugly, and you can call it beautiful, or I can call it, you know how, what I'm getting at there. Let's say you're standing with a group of friends at the Grand Canyon. Everyone is absolutely amazed and blown away by the beauty of that place. Who's witnessed the beauty firsthand at the Grand Canyon? Pretty incredible. A few of you, you gotta get out. All right, you gotta get out. Let's say you're standing there though, a group of friends, and all of a sudden, that guy in your group. It's like, like the guy you didn't wanna bring on the trip anyway but he's there, and all of a sudden that guy says something like this. It's nothing special. It's just a giant hole in the ground. There's just a bunch of particles that have accidentally fallen into place. I mean, what's the big deal anyway? The big deal is that you don't think this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. And we all know that those comments say more about that person than do about the Grand Canyon, right? Because that place is beautiful whether you call it that or not. That place is beautiful whether you say it or not. That place is beautiful whether you affirm it or not. They believe that we are the source of beauty. We are the epitome of beauty. And we can satisfy our craving if we can just get enough products or, or go through enough procedures. I mean, $202, come on. I should be able to get beautiful, right? I should be able to become beautiful. But I have two questions to show the idiocy, I think, of that ideology. The first is this. What gives certain people the right 
to define beauty for the rest of us? What gives a handful of people the right to tell everybody else what is beautiful? Let me show you a picture of a few people. You might know some of these folks, you might not. The woman there on the top left is uh, Joanna Coles. She's the editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan Magazine, number one selling magazine for years on end that deals with women's issues, beauty, sex, kind of everything in between. That's Dylan Jones there on the bottom. He's the editor of GQ Magazine, kind of the guy equivalent of Cosmo. And then that little group of folks right there, those are the judges for the 2015 Miss America pageant that just happened recently. And these people are more or less the experts on all things beauty. But I kind of want to revert back to my snotty preteen days and I want to ask, who made you the boss of me? <laughs> right? I mean, who made you the king of the universe? In all honesty, in all seriousness, what gives those eight or nine people the right to define beauty for every other person? Why are they the ultimate authority on this topic? I mean, chiefs in ancient Africa used to define a beautiful woman as the plumpest woman there is. In fact, if she couldn't sit on her camel, she was deemed the most beautiful because she wasn't going to pass away the next day. She was healthy. She was strong. She had lots of food available. That was beautiful. We went to Thailand and spent some time on the mission field there, and I went out to dinner one night with some guys, and I was like, all right, tell me what woman in this bar, is, in this restaurant, is the, uh, is the most beautiful? And, uh, and they said, oh, let me look, let me look. They picked out a woman that looked like a ghost. Her skin was as pale white as you could get. We flew home a few days later to Southern California, and some young guys were looking for the tannest skin on the beach. And that's what they deemed the most beautiful. So the African guys deemed it this way. The Thai guys deemed it this way. The SoCal guys deemed it this way. Dylan Jones deems it this way. Who gives anyone the right to define it for everybody else? I mean, come on, if it's that arbitrary, hear ye, hear ye. Six foot balding white men with chicken legs are now the standard and epitome of all that is beautiful. This is it. This is it. Brad, you're a little taller, but you got the bald thing down now, my friend. So you're beautiful. You're beautiful, buddy. I mean, come on. Who, who gets to define it for everybody else? That's crazy. A handful of people can't determine what beauty is. They don't have the right. They're not the source of it. They didn't create it. They don't have a complete understanding of it. But more than that, more than just defining it for us, that handful of people, they typically mess it up. They typically portray these unrealistic definitions. They actually deceive us as they're defining it. And their deception is destroying us. Introducing the next revolution in beauty. Get ready to experience a whole new you. It's you, perfected. Say goodbye to fine lines and wrinkles and hello to full lips, sparkling eyes, and lashes that never end. And that's just the beginning. Transform your look the way celebrities do with this beauty industry secret that's now available for the first time ever. Introducing Photoshop by Adobe. Finally look the way you've always dreamed. The difference is clear. Just one application of Photoshop can give you results so dramatic they're almost unrealistic. Use Healing Brush to target blemishes at their source by simply erasing them. ProPixel Intensifying Photanical Hydrojargon Microbead Extract infused with nutritive volumizing technology will leave your face virtually unrecognizable. My skin feels like plastic! Take control of your color with hue saturation. Use this breakthrough formula to change hair or skin color, brighten eyes, whiten teeth, even adjust your race. Tired of fighting with your shape? Wish you could be a total knockout? Dial in the perfect you with Liquify. Reshape your body without the expense and mess of surgery. Why eat healthy and exercise when you can just look like you do? And the best part is... It won't rub off. The results don't lie. Pictures like this are all Photoshop. The celebrity beauty secret used in virtually every major magazine is now available to you. You don't have to rely on a healthy body image or self-respect anymore. Now that's the power of Photoshop. There's only one way to look like a real cover girl. Photoshop by Adobe. Maybe she's born with it. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure it's Photoshop.